All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. So um, I'm I'm Greg Keston. Um, I teach physics um, here and at Harvard, and um, I'm the associate director of science ed. And on behalf of the Harvard Division of Science, uh, Harvard Bookstore, and the Harvard Library, I'm very excited to welcome you to this Harvard Science Book Talk with Professor Paul Halpern, who will be discussing his book, The Allure of the Multiverse, with Dr. Jacob Barandes. Um, before we get into all of that, um, I want to mention, uh, if you would like to see uh, some of our other talks, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, if you just go on YouTube and look up Harvard Science Book Talks, you should be able to find it. Um, and also just Googling that same thing, Harvard Science Book Talks, um, you should be able to find our website where we have upcoming events. And um, some of our upcoming events, just to give you a little teaser here, um, we have uh, Sean Carroll on uh, May 13th talking about his book, Quanta and Fields, uh, The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. Um, we have Leslie Valiant on, um, on April 17th uh, talking about um, the impo importance of being educable, a new theory of human uniqueness. Um, and on April 3rd, in about a week, um, Matt Strassler will be talking about his book, Waves in, an, in a, Waves in an Impossible Sea, How Everyday Life Emerges from the Cosmic Ocean. Um, so we look forward to seeing you uh, at those as well. But the main event tonight, we're very excited to have Professor Paul Halpern, who is a professor of physics at St. Joseph's University. Um, he's authored 18 popular science books, including Flashes of Creation, The Quantum Labyrinth, Einstein's Dice and Schrodinger's Cat, and Synchronicity. Those are just, just some of them. Um, he is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and is a fellow of the American Physical Society. And uh, one uh, one thing that you know he you know should be very proud of I'm I'm in awe of is he was also on the Simpsons Simpsons um, the 20th anniversary special um, so look at that um, and he'll be in conversation with Dr Jacob Barandis who is a theoretical physicist and philosopher of science uh, here at Harvard um, where he also completed his PhD in theoretical physics. Um, Dr. Berendis teaches courses um, on the fundamentals of theoretical physics, general relativity, uh, history and philosophy of quantum mechanics, and um, his research publications focus on foundations of quantum theory, philosophy of science, quantum field theory, um, those sort of things. Uh, um, he also organizes um, the annual New England workshop on the history and philosophy of physics, as well as the international seminar series on uh, physics and philosophy of science. Um, and I should say, a uh, show related thing related to Jacob, he was actually the star of an ABC show, but they didn't air it because they didn't want to put all the other stars on their other shows to shame. Um, Cause it was, it was, it was just, uh, you know, too, too great. As you will see, um, we have two wonderful stars uh, in conversation tonight. Um, and one relevant uh, piece of information about Jacob is um, he is a multiverse skeptic. So we'll hear about that. Um, so we'll be discussing Professor Halpern's book, The Allure of the Multiverse, which the Wall Street Journal says is a splendidly lucid narrative of a century's development in relativity particle physics, and cosmic speculation. Um, so um, before we get into Professor Halpern's presentation, which will precede the dialogue between um, these two stars, um, uh, so we'll hear a little bit about the book uh, in that presentation. But um, following all of that presentation and conversation, um, you uh, will be able to have your questions answered. So if you at, at any point you have a question that you want answered, just drop it into the Q&A. And then toward the end, uh, we'll try to get those, those questions answered. And in just a minute, when we start, um, I will also drop a link into the chat uh, so you can buy the book. Uh, Without further ado, um, I, I will uh, leave the stage, this digital podium, uh, to Professor Halpern. Hello. Uh, thank you, Greg, for the kind introduction. I really appreciate that. And I'm really excited to be here virtually at Harvard Bookstore. I wish I could be there for real because I really love Cambridge and spent many uh, happy times visiting uh, Cambridge. 
But what I wanted to talk about, and I'm going to um, share a PowerPoint, is um, why I looked at uh, ideas about the multiverse. There are many different ideas about the multiverse and how I came into writing the book. So let me share my screen. And um, so um, my book is The Allure of the Multiverse. And um, in coming into studying ideas about the multiverse and presenting them um, in kind of an open-minded way, I try not to be biased in my book. Um, one question that came up and, and I hear addressed very often about multiverse ideas is why look at something that's not directly observable and in particular, why look at something that might not be falsifiable or verifiable? And in fact, um, if you look at the scientific method over the years, verifiability and falsifiability are certainly very important parts of the scientific method. And there are things that um, should not be dropped lightly. So if we're going to not have a theory that's not directly uh, verifiable, there has to be ample reason for that. And, and an example of uh, the scientific method in action is in 1928, Dirac uh, came up with the Dirac equation and uh, one of the solutions was uh, a positive version of the electron. And originally he, he thought it might be a proton. The mass was not right for a proton, but later uh, he uh, came up with the idea of positrons, which were uh, verified by Carl Anderson in 1932. So only four years later, Nobel Prize winning discovery. And here we have theoretical speculation, direct verification, and everything worked out well for the idea of what we now know as antiparticles. In astronomy, direct observation is something that is ideal. So that's why it's very exciting to see images from the James Webb Space Telescope, um, direct observation of the distant past of the universe. However, we should note that in cosmology, we know that there are limits to direct observation. The observable universe is 46 billion light years in radius. And that number comes up because um, even though the age of the universe is about 13.8 billion years old, um, we know that the universe is expanding and accelerating in its expansion. So that's why um, we can see galaxies uh, out to galaxies that um, are now um, 46 billion, uh, theoretically 46 billion light years away currently. But the question is, if the observable universe is limited, do we ignore everything beyond it? Do we just not talk about anything aside from the observable universe? Well, that would be very limited. For example, in general relativity, we talk about the shape of space. Do we, we say it's either a hypersphere, the generalization in higher dimensions of a soccer ball, or it's a hyperbolic, like a potato chip in higher dimensions, or it's planar, something like a box stretched in all directions infinitely. So we don't say it's planar, but drops off at the end of the observable universe, and then we know nothing's out there. We just say, well, the universe is flat or the universe is uh, curved. We make general statements about the whole universe, even though we know we'll never be able to see beyond the observable universe. We infer that. So inference is a very important part of science, and it's not ideal to just have inference, but sometimes that's all we can go on. Another example is the interior of a black hole um, within the event horizon. That's something that we can't really observe. If an astronaut went in there, the astronaut could not send a signal out. So there's no way we can do direct observation. And these uh, parts of science where that are speculative but based upon theory, uh, there are things that people feel very comfortable about in many cases. And um, movies and science fiction stories play with these ideas because it represents the unknown. And so, for example, black holes were proposed around 1970 and, um, and you know, in their full form, by, uh, in a name such by John Wheeler. 
And uh, very soon thereafter, Disney played with the idea and speculated about what would be inside the interior of an event horizon. And that ended up with being very strange stuff, like imagining a hellscape inside the event horizon where you would be judged for your sins and so forth. Something certainly uh, not having to, anything to do with physics, but um, uh, a sort of a fun story. And similarly, there are a lot of fun stories about multiverse ideas uh, from Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, the Spider-Verse films, and uh, most recently, Everything Everywhere All at Once, which uh, last year won many Oscars. Uh, so this is certainly in the public mind, but the multiverse ideas talked about in films are certainly not the scientific multiverse. These are just fun multiverse ideas, very different from the scientific multiverse ideas. Why does a multiverse have an appeal to the public? Um, well, we want to know what lies beyond frontiers. So if we say the observable universe is limited, what lies beyond that? We still keep asking questions. And then uh, we also wonder about our lives. We made different choices in our lives, you know, place, different places to live in. Um, you know, we choose uh, Harvard versus Oxford or Cambridge. You know, what would it would happen if we had made different choices about careers or jobs or, you know, uh, universities? And what would happen if we had made different choices on our relationships? There's no way of knowing that. But, um, you know, these things are exciting to speculate about. And we never know if we do something, what the repercussions would be. So if you catch a train, you feel very lucky. But what if you uh, caught a train and it was in an accident? Or what if you caught a train and if you had missed it and caught the next train, uh, your future partner was on the next train, but you missed meeting them uh, because you caught the train. So you really don't know if something is good or bad. And that's why we speculate about other branches of reality in science fiction. But as it turns out, physics does not talk about other versions of people um, having different lives. That's, that's really um, sci science fiction speculation. And an example of this is the film Sliding Doors, uh, where the lead character is shown either catching or missing a, a subway train what happens to her in either case. So um, once we, we talk about these fun ideas in the movies, then, um, then it sounds like the multiverse is just science fiction and should we even talk about it? Well, um, it, I think it does make sense to think about things that are not directly observable, especially if a theory is complete and theory makes sense within the observable region, but we have certain, you know, boundaries or certain areas that we can't quite observe. And uh, we speculate about those, but everything else about the theory makes sense. It might make sense to just accept the fact that there are things we don't know. So the story of the scientific idea of the multiverse begins with one of Albert Einstein's final talks in 1954, and he was invited to speak to John Wheeler's relativity class. And Einstein in the talk asked whether or not a mouse could trigger quantum measurements. This is part of Einstein's quantum skepticism. We all know that he said, God does not play dice with the universe, but he also was skeptical about the idea of quantum measurements and the idea of of uh, triggering, uh, human triggering wave function collapse. Attending the lecture was a young student of Wheeler, um, Hugh Everett III, who uh, this got Hugh Everett thinking about alternatives to the standard idea of quantum measurement. And this is a picture of Everett, not quite when he was a student, but a little bit later. So in standard orthodox quantum physics, you have a um, something called a Hilbert space, which is a space of all possibilities. And then um, that can be spread out, uh, you know, information can be spread out over numerous probabil 
possibilities weighed according to their probabilities. And then somebody decides to take a position measurement and a wave function collapses into one of the position values. Well, Everett said, well, what happens if collapse never occurs and the observer um, does not trigger collapse, but is rather a passive participant. So the observer is not active, but the observer is actually part of this quantum state. And therefore the observer observer's conscious memory encompasses in a superposition all of the possible results. So here we have um, a, a multiplicity of observers who um, each see a different outcome of a quantum state. Um, one might see a electron to the left of the detector, another might see an electron spot on, and the other might see electron to the right of a detector. Um, so three different possibilities, three different branches of the same observer, and they don't know that they're branching, um, they don't know about each other, so everything is fine in terms of uh, they're not even sensing that they're splitting. Everett tried to convince Niels Bohr of considering this idea uh, of uh, splitting, uh, but Bohr would never give him the time of day. This is um, Everett at Princeton with Bohr, and this is uh, Charles Misner, who recently passed away. It was Everett's good friend. But um, later, uh, Wheeler sent uh, for a conference proceedings, Bryce DeWitt, an eminent physicist, copy of a paper by Everett for the proceedings. And Bryce DeWitt, was the, as the editor, was very skeptical and said, well, I don't feel any splitting. This is not science. And Everett said, well, Copernicus predicted that the Earth is turning and we don't feel the Earth turning. Does that mean it's wrong? And Everett responded, touche, young man. You have a good point. And, and DeWitt became one of the leading uh, proponents of many worlds, which is a name that he gave to it. He first called it the many universes interpretation, which later became many worlds. And that's the name that stuck. And in 1970, uh, he published a Physics Today article, which got a lot of people excited about this idea. So, um, so we can really credit DeWitt, Bryce DeWitt, for promoting the idea of many worlds and also the idea of the multiverse in science, because it was really the first multiverse idea that was embraced by scientists uh, to some extent, I should say, or considered by scientists, at least to some extent. Around that time, Brandon Carter, who um, uh, was at Cambridge, um, uh, originally from Australia, um, was wondering about what's called the fine tuning problem, which is why our sector of the universe or our universe itself is special. And why, for example, is gravity just the right strength for, for um, stars and planets to form? But if it was too strong, the universe would have collapsed very early on and we wouldn't be here. And if it was if it was too weak, maybe there wouldn't be star formation or planet formation, we wouldn't be here. So we're kind of in a Goldilocks uh, region of the universe or even a Goldilocks universe, which has just the right conditions um, to produce um, life, and particularly intelligent life, that can talk about that universe. So Carter speculated in what he called the strong anthropic principle about all these other universes out there that have different properties and are not ideal for planet formation, for life. And the reason we don't know about these is because they can't support intelligent beings to speculate about those. So we happen to be uh, part of a filter where all the uh, bad universes, the ones that can't support life are filtered out and we're in, we're in the best of all possible universes, the one that can support intelligent life. And that's the anthropic principle. Um, so, um, shortly thereafter, um, inflationary theory, uh, developed, uh, by Alan Guth and others. And I see that professor Guth seems to be in the audience here. Um, so I'm very honored, um, was a way of trying to explain conditions of the universe, such as its smoothness, such as why 
um, radiation, if uh, cosmic background radiation, if you look in all directions, is very close to the same direction in all sky as oh, very close to the same amount in all sky directions. And uh, the universe is very close to flat, um, which is shape of the universe. And galaxy counts are similar in all directions. And there are a lot of reasons to believe that the universe went through a phase of extremely rapid exponential expansion very early on in its history that took the observable universe uh, in a tiny fraction of a second from something like subatomic size to the size of a baseball. And I say size of a baseball because from then it underwent slow expansion from the size of a baseball to the size of the observable universe today. So if you roll the observable universe backward in time to the moment after inflation, it was about the size of a baseball. And if you look a split second earlier, it was the size of an elementary particle. And um, that helps explain the uniformity of the observable universe, its flatness and sameness, is it's a little bit like a sheet that's stretched out ultra fast and wrinkles and smooths out all the wrinkles in that sheet. And it also explains structure formation. So it's a very widely accepted theory. But then shortly thereafter, um, Andre Linde and others showed that inflation is relatively easy to produce and that if inflation happens one place in one time, it can happen many places and many times uh, from something that's technically known as a scalar field, a kind of energy field with certain properties, and that produces ultra exponential expansion. It triggers it automatically in Einstein's general equations of relativity. So that means that um, if inflation happens one place, it happens many, many, many places. And that's the idea of eternal inflation, which is another type of multiverse. Now, all these inflating universes would inflate very quickly beyond um, detectability. So we would not be able to de detect right now other bubble universes, but we might look backward in time at the cosmic microwave background radiation and see if there are scars in that leftover from uh, cosmic collisions between bubble universes. So um, we could do this with, um, with the cosmic microwave background mappings, um, what's sometimes called the baby picture of the universe, look for scars of collisions. And a group that included Hirana Pires has been doing that um, with, uh, so far, uh, no success in finding something that is statistically um, statistically relevant, but um, looking for uh, signs of uh, collisions between bubble universes, which might be the most prominent promising way if we could find this to prove the idea of a multiverse. Um, another area, and I know I'm going pretty quickly through this, so that's why I'm going to take a lot of questions. Another place the multiverse emerges is string theory. You have um, 10 to the 500 possible ways to fold up the higher dimensions of string theory into compactified dimensions, uh, kind of like origami, squeezing together higher dimensions into tiny dimensions. And the reason you need that is because string theory needs 10 dimensions to work, but the observable universe is three spatial dimensions plus one dimension of time. So we need a way to fold up the higher dimensions, but there are an astronomical number of ways to fold these up. So maybe these represent other universes out there and um, we're part of an array of possibilities. That's sometimes called the string landscape. And then that some idea is sometimes used to explain why something called the cosmological constant, which is anti-gravity term introduced by Einstein is very small. Einstein, when he was proposed his original model of the universe, added a term for stability called the cosmological constant to keep the universe from expanding or contracting. But later when we showed, Hubble showed that the universe expands, he discarded the term. But then um, in 1998, two teams of astronomers discovered that the universe is speeding up in its expansion. So provided extra boost, 
one way of modeling it is to include a cosmological constant, but a very, 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 very tiny one. But string theorists and other field theorists have shown that um, you can calculate the cosmological constant of the universe, and it turns out to be very large. So um, one idea is, is that maybe we um, are in a very odd universe with a particularly small cosmological constant, and that's the only universe that works to create life. And there's all these other universes out there with large cosmological constants that were unsuccessful, and that's why we're not there. So um, once again, I apologize. I went through a lot of ideas very quickly, but I'm very excited to answer um, Jacob's questions and, and any other questions from the audience. But my conclusion is that multiverses in fiction and science are very different. And there are many different types of scientific multiverses that have very particular properties. Many worlds in quantum physics, the anthropic principle at speculating why we're here, eternal inflation, which is this idea that there are other bubble universes out there that are triggered by um, scalar fields in the early universe, and then string theory, which imagines this landscape of possibilities. So for more about the multiverse, this is the cover of my book, which is available at Harvard Bookstore and um, other places, but please purchase it at Harvard Bookstore to support this program. So I'm going to stop here. Um, and uh, let's see. I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, I will uh, be glad to engage in a dialogue with Jacob, which will be very exciting. All right, I think that's my cue. Yes. Um, <laughs> hi, Professor Halpern. It's a delight to be here and, and talking with you um, about your book. Uh, if, if I may give an endorsement, this is a really fabulous book. It's incredibly well-researched. I learned a lot about, uh, in particular, the history and the very curious personalities of the people who were responsible for the various incarnations of the multiverse. I learned a lot of things I didn't know. Um, so I highly recommend this book and all of Professor Halpern's books, which are excellent. Um, so, you know, with, with that with that being said, let's move on to some questions. Um, so I guess my first question is, uh, just speaking personally, uh, where did you start when it comes to multiverses and their various uh, conceptual incarnations? Uh, and how did your own personal views um, about the various kinds of multiverses evolve? over the course of, I think, broadly speaking, your own physics career, but also in researching and writing this book? Okay, well, um, when I was in my youth, I was really interested in science fiction and also popular science. I read a lot of people who were inspired in my generation, uh, the, uh, some of the works of George Gamow, founder of the Big Bang Theory, but also a great popularizer. And he wrote this book, One, Two, Three, Infinity, which talks about higher dimensions and all these really weird things, these fringe things. And I became interested sort of in fringe ideas like higher dimensions. And when I was in graduate school, I looked at classical ideas for um, multidimensional uh, vari uh, variations of general relativity, adding extra dimensions, uh, kind of you know what is called generally Kaluza-Klein theory. Um, but was looking at some ideas and that, and I was also looking at the mixed master universe, which was an attempt before inflation to explain the horizon problem and uh, at Stony Brook um, and uh, under Max Dresden, who I later found out was interested in many worlds and, and corresponded with Everett, which was surprising because he never mentioned that to me. Um, but, uh, but then um, I sort of, became familiar with many worlds. Um, the first time I really learned a lot about it was at John Wheeler's 90th birthday party. It, there was a celebration at Princeton and all these great physicists were there to give talks. And Bryce DeWitt gave a talk about uh, the many worlds interpretation. And I had heard previously about other ideas about um, quantum measurement theory, but I wasn't too well versed in it. I knew about spontaneous localization ideas, 
because I was the, um, my first job at Hamilton College was being the sabbatical replacement for one of the prominent quantum measurement people, Phil, Philip Pearl, who was one of the people who developed spontaneous localization theory. So he had sort of told me about it. And I was, I'd sort of started out like, well, the orthodox idea is probably right since everybody talks about it. And then, well, maybe the spontaneous localization stuff would work, but then I didn't really read anything that convinced me about it. And then when I heard about many worlds, I thought, well, this is a really interesting idea. Um, I'm sure it has snags, but it, it kind of sounds interesting to just allow the wave function to be itself and allow people to be part of the wave function. And, you know, everything is just continuation of the Schrodinger equation and nothing, we don't have to even worry about collapse. And that's kind of what I knew about it when I started finding out about all these um, multiverse movies. Oh I, oh, I should say also uh, read a lot about in, in, about internal inflation and I found that idea really interesting. And I knew about the debate between eternal inflation and uh, the cyclic ideas. And I, uh, I interviewed Paul Steinhardt um, very early on when he first developed his cyclic ideas, when he was kind of a little bit on the fence between inflation and new ideas, but kind of said, well, we need alternatives. And now he's come out very strongly against uh, eternal inflation and very strongly in favor of of other ideas. But at the time I interviewed him, he was kind of willing to entertain alternatives, which was kind of interesting. So I knew about that. And that's what sort of led me toward the book because I thought, well, it's a popular idea. Um, I've written books before about the Simpsons and things that are kind of pop culture. So I can sort of take it from a pop culture approach, but also take it from a uh, point of view of the cosmology, which I know about, from the point of view of alternative solutions to general relativity, which was my PhD work. So I knew a bit about that. And then I didn't know so much about uh, many worlds, but I thought, well, I'll learn why people believe in that and why that makes sense. And I, I did, I have to say, I did become in researching that as I went on, uh, skeptical about the idea of these branching ratios. I don't really, I didn't really see a solution that explained in my mind, and I'm not a philosopher of science, but didn't really explain how you could get these uh, same branching ratio ratios as you get with the Born rule, which is a rule for coming up with uh, predictions about, you know, results in quantum quantum measurements. Um, so, so I was excited to see that you have some ideas, Jacob, for that, and uh, you know, other people have ideas. But you know, my book, I kept an open mind, and I think I try to present the ideas fairly and try to present the debates fairly. And, uh, you know, some of the strong statements that people make, you know, extremes, uh, everything from like the multiverse is not even wrong, which a few people said, including uh, Freeman Dyson or many. He said many worlds is not even wrong. You shouldn't even shouldn't even think about it. You shouldn't even consider it science uh, to people who are basically like, well, it's a central part of quantum mechanics. And if you don't believe in many worlds, you don't believe in quantum mechanics. Uh, th that's that's fantastic, actually. Um, so uh, let me just say from a, 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 a personal point of view, um, there is kind of a cartoon version of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics that I think a lot of people who read popular books uh, and even people who work in physics often, often carry around. Um, but of course, in writing this book, you you read a lot of like original literature. You read the writings of Everett. You you read the writings of a number of people who've who've worked on um, you know on on this this idea of the many worlds approach from a physics standpoint, from a philosophical standpoint. Um, what would you say you gleaned are some of the differences between the cartoon version and the the kind of the version that that people who seriously try to work on this uh actually think that it looks like and and maybe i'll leave it at that i have i have some additional things that i, I might add but but actually i'd prefer to hear from you 
So where, where do you well, think the cartoon version and the version that people who look at this series? Well, I think the popular approach? version version is is basically like every time you make a choice. I mean, the extreme version is every time you make a choice in life, you branch and that all the other possible versions of you that made a different choice are out there somewhere. And if we could access them, then we could know about all the other choices we make. And then the more limited version would be like, well, every time you do um, a physics experiment or something that there are, you know, if, if anything is possible, it will be out there somewhere. And uh, as long as something is, doesn't violate the laws laws of physics. And, and then um, there's this idea, which I have to say, I, I sort of wrote, wrote a blog post about, and now I'm a little bit embarrassed because I think I sort of maybe greatly simplified it. There's this idea of quantum immortality that, you know, you could, uh, you know, experience something horrible, you know, you're in an accident, but there's always going to be another version of you that survives because of many worlds. And that version will, will live on. And then something else might happen, you know, disease or something else, but then there's always going to be one version that survives. So then everybody, according to many worlds, can really live forever. And that, that in a way, that would be nice, although in a way it would be miserable because then everybody you know will be gone and you'd eventually you'd be like the only one in the universe, which would be kind of sad and lonely. But, uh, but anyway, because you'd be the only, you'd be the, the rare version of, of, with all these branches that survives everything and then you'd be like alone. But um, but the problem with that is that, um, you know, in, in quantum measurement, the differences might be very, very subtle, like an electron being a one nanometer, you know, to the right of a marker versus being two nanometers to the right of the marker. So even if you believe in, in branching, there'd be two versions of you, one would, would say, oh, the electron was one nanometer, and the other would say, no, it's two nanometers, if you could have a conversation, and um, which would be very boring, and there'd be no volition, and there'd be no uh, alternative versions of you, it would be a very boring alternative version of you, unless, for some reason, uh, one measurement, you know, and this doesn't happen in science, you take a measurement, and that one measurement gets you the Nobel Prize. Well, of course, we know that that's not going to happen in science, a single measurement. So it just, it, it, it's just, it's very likely that nothing really will, there will be nothing really significant coming out of it. And um, I guess I didn't think before I studied this about this idea of, of branching. And that really seems to be a drawback because if you have something that's, Point zero 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 two three two percent possible. Like, how is the universe going to split up exactly in that way? And it just seems unnecessarily complicated that you would find yourself with that percentage chance in a universe where that outcome happens. Um, so it doesn't. That doesn't really quite um, click with me. Um, so if it's all right, because we're already getting some very interesting uh, audience questions, I mean, I have a whole list of questions and I, I can, as you know, you, you, you'll, it will be unsurprising to hear from our dialogue before we began. I, I could just go on. Um, but we have some very interesting audience questions. I'd like to turn to those as they come in. And when we don't have them, then I'll continue with some of my own questions. So here's okay. a, a really nice question. Uh, Brian Green and Max Tegmark talk about a version of the multiverse as simply whatever lies beyond our observable universe. They imagine duplicates of our planet and selves in infinite space with apparently infinite matter and energy distributed in it. Uh, could you comment on this? And actually, um, if I may just add a little bit to this, there's a, a lovely discussion in your book uh, about you know what might lie beyond our universe and also a really lovely discussion about Poincaré recurrence, which you know, plays a very interesting role here. So maybe you could address this question and then maybe also talk a little bit about uh, about these other things, in, in particular point career occurrence, which is, which is one of those things that most people outside of physics have not heard of, but is incredibly interesting. Yeah, well, the term multiverse, I mean, 
uh, it, some people think it's a little unfortunate because uh, you can talk about the observable universe and the actual universe, physical universe. And if you believe in internal inflation, you could, you could say that the, the universe encompasses all these other bubbles, the real universe. So there's a way, ways to get around the term multiverse. But if you believe, if you use the term multiverse, you can use it to refer to everything that lies beyond the observable universe that's out there. And it could very well be infinite or it could be, you know, much, much larger, you know, trillions and trillions of times larger than the observable universe. And statistically, uh, there'd be chances for replication. If you have a finite number of elements uh, and you have an infinite space, eventually you have repetition going on. It's a little bit, I like to say a little bit like uh, if you're a tic-tac-toe aficionado, tic-tac-toe is a finite number of spaces and a finite number of, of possibilities. Uh, you eventually repeat the tic-tac-toe moves. And with chess, the same thing, only much longer. So if you have um, if you have a number of atoms, they might um, and different combinations, they might repeat themselves somewhere out there. And I, I talk in my book about Louis Blanqui's idea in the 19th century. He was in a fortress, imprisoned for his political beliefs, and he imagined, and there might be another planet out there in the universe that's that's like Earth, just statistically. Um, and maybe the French Revolution and other revolutions happen there, and uh, he might be in prison there, or things might be different and speculated about that, which was very interesting. Um, so well before the multiverse, there were speculations about uh, worlds that are like Earth or exact replicas in space and time. So uh, that's certainly possible given a large enough universe. So this is gonna um, uh, uh, give a clear indication of some of my own uh, intellectual preferences, but um, very interested in, in etymological questions. So where where does the word even come from, and how did it evolve to take on its current meaning? Well, as I, I mentioned in my book, um, one of the first mentions of the word multiverse was in William James. Um, uh, who's a psychologist, a uh, work he wrote in the late 19th century, where he wanted to talk about a universe that's neither good or evil, or evil but uh, morally ambiguous. So he called it the moral multiverse of, you know, neither good or evil, but somehow a mixture of things. So the term has been used for mixture of things. Uh, Michael Moorcock, the science fiction writer, used it around 1970 to talk about... Um, possible worlds with uh, characters that are kind of like avatars, which ha take on, uh, they have like key personalities, but take on different um, different aspects on different worlds, uh, which, which dates back to religious ideas in Hinduism of this idea of an avatar and, uh, you know, uh, Vishnu taking on different, roles in different eras like Krishna and so forth. Don't want to get too much into religion since it's not my field, but um, so there's these ideas about alternative selves and um, the term multiverse came into physics kind of around the, the turn of the 21st century when um, people start to realize that there are big problems with standard, standard model, um, this big discrepancy between as I mentioned, the, the cosmological constant in field theory, and which is very high, and the cosmological constant in a, in a astro astronomical observation, which, if it exists, uh, is very, very low. And then this idea of an array of universes. And, and Steven Weinberg uh, advocated for the multiverse and said, well, this is really the only way we can fine tune things is having all these other universes out there. And that's really when it caught on. And thanks to people like him and Max Tegmark, who was mentioned, was a big advocate and is a big advocate for multiverse ideas and came up with a classification of multiverse ideas, which I mentioned in the book, but I don't want to repeat Max Tegmark. So I just mentioned it briefly, but cited Matt, Max. Um, so, um, so, so and but you know the essence of it was really um 
Bryce DeWitt publicizing many worlds around 1970 when other people like Brandon Carter start to say, well, maybe there are other universes out there. And then it became uh, in the in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, part of inflation through eternal inflation. Yeah, I mean, in Everett's original thesis, he referred to his own interpretation or formulation of quantum theory as the theory of the universal wave function. That was that was the title of his original long form dissertation draft. Um, and then in his like shorter version, he called it the relative state uh, relative state formulation or interpretation of, of quantum mechanics. This other language, it really it shows that much later. It's very interesting. Um, that uh, argument by Steven Weinberg uh, in the 80s, um, where he helped himself to anthropic reasoning um, to make a prediction about what he thought the as yet undetected cosmological constant would be. Um, and he got, a, he got an answer that was remarkably, you know, in, in certainly for its time, remarkably close to the true answer. Um, would you be willing to talk a little bit a, a, about that? Because it was it was kind of a moment when a lot of people um, in the physics community, even separate from Bryce DeWitt's article, began to take anthropic reasoning and possibly even the multiverse, at least the cosmic, the multiverse of, of many bubble universes seriously. Yeah, well, I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, having someone who's so prominent, you know, a Nobel Prize winner and a great popularizer advocating for multiverse really you know, made people start taking that idea very seriously. And then the problem that he he addressed is this idea of of you know calculating the the cosmological constant from scratch using quantum field theory and it being so large. And at that time, uh people a lot of people thought it was zero. And hey, wait a minute, oh my God, there's all this this energy, repulsive energy out there. The universe should be splitting apart universe should be exploding and here it is you know expanding very very slowly and um he, you know he had a really good point to try to to come up with a way of um you know of, uh, of using an array of possibilities to to make this argument so uh, i thought that was very powerful yeah and it, it, it's of course always a little bit dangerous right when you when you have some um, uh, you know, uh, strange observation. So, in, of course, in, in Steven Weinberg's case, he made a prediction, which is great. Um, but but sometimes we see strange things, and it is tempting to appeal to anthropic and multiverse explanations for those things, right? Why does this thing have the value that it has? Why does this property of our universe look the way it does? Well, maybe there are lots of universes in which it has different properties, and we're just in one of the ones in which it has the value that it has. You see that the you know, there's always the, the the risk that that one is copping out and not looking for a more fundamental explanation. In Steven Weinberg's case, he was making an actual prediction that ended up not being too far off from what ended up being the measured value of the cosmological constant, but that was many years later. Mm. Mm. Um, so I want to give an opportunity for more people to ask questions. We have a couple of, of uh, we, we have some time left. So uh, if people have questions, please. Ah, good. Uh, Okay, so this is a I, I, this is a great one. All right, so, um, and I was hoping we would get to this. And if if and I had this on my list to ask if this wasn't asked in the audience. I'm really glad that one of our audience members asked it. Um, this audience member asks, "I have a question about Schrodinger's cat in the box." To my understanding, the cat is until it's observed uh, between a state of life and death in some zombie-like state of decay. Over time, all forms of life age and inevitably decay. A fact of being human is that we are constantly in some state of decay. How is it that we are different from the cat in the box? So maybe you could talk a little bit about Schrodinger's cat, that thought experiment, maybe a little bit where it came from, why Schrodinger introduced it, what his like what he was trying to get at with this thought experiment in 1935, um, and maybe why it's different from you know, other forms of life and death or decay that we talk about or experience as mortal and mostly classical beings. Um, yeah, yeah the so, so Schrodinger's cat thought experiment is actually only a paragraph or two in a long paper about, you know, his interpretation, uh, Schrodinger's interpretation and critique of quantum theory at the time. And it was part of a dialogue in the 1930s that Schrodinger had with Albert Einstein 
And um, both uh, Schrodinger knew that, that Einstein was very skeptical about um, standard version of quantum mechanics for a number of reasons. So uh, you can you can list many, many different reasons why Einstein was skeptical from the randomness aspect, which is probably the most famous, uh, to the idea of spooky action at a distance or in, entanglement, um, or and also uh, this this idea that you need you need an observer rather than things being objective. So Einstein thought that you should have something called local realism, uh, and the realism being that you know position and momentum should be there even if no one observes them. They should have definite values, and it's only um, you know the imprecision or lack of good measuring apparatus why we would see um, randomness or or fuzziness and so forth. But if we we had ideal measuring devices, we should be able to measure everything out there, which is part of Einstein's uh, determinism and idea that um, that everything must follow from everything else and everything must you know be locally connected, not connected over a distance. Um, so Schrodinger knew about all this stuff and wanted to make a contribution. So he he created an absurdity, which he knew that there's this idea of quantum superposition. So if you have a, a radioactive sample and it's it has a certain probability of decaying, then we know that let's say it has a 50-50 chance of decaying in an hour, then you can talk about the sample being in a superposition of decayed and not decayed until it's observed. And then um, you, you have this, this thing called collapse in, in the orthodox interpretation where you have either decayed or not decayed after you take the measurement. And uh, the measurement could be with a Geiger counter or something like that. So Schrodinger imagined putting a Geiger counter with a radioactive sample that has a 50-50 chance of decaying within an hour in a box along with a cat and you have a flask of poison that can be broken with a hammer. And if the Geiger counter measures a decay, then the flask of poison is broken and the cat is killed. And if the Geiger counter does not measure decay, then the flask is intact and the cat survives. And then everything is closed off. And the idea is that just like the sample is in a superposition of decayed and not decayed, the cat is in a weird zombie-like mixture of alive and dead until we open up the box and make an observation. And then we either see to our horror that it's dead or to our delight that it's alive. And uh, the Everett interpretation of that, by the way, is that um, is that the universe branches and that one universe, the cat is dead and one universe, the cat is alive. And then one universe, the observer is horrified and one observe universe, the observer is delighted. Um, if you if you take this extreme example at face value, now that said, um, Schrodinger was making a parody. Uh, we know that um, cats are made of atoms, so they're very complicated states, and you'd have to look at all of the interactions. And there's something called decoherence, which talks about all the interactions between, you know things, including large things that are made up of lots of atoms. And um, so you don't have purity, pure states necessarily. Uh, but anyway, that's that's uh, Schrodinger's cat in a nutshell. But Schrodinger didn't really believe in it. It was more like an, an argument made from absurdity, like, well, isn't this absurd? Um, we can't, quantum mechanics has all these flaws, this idea of entanglement, this idea of superposition, this idea of that you split up large things or human scale things from tiny things. So Schrodinger was hoping that someone would come along and come up with a better better scheme or that he himself could come up with a better scheme. Um, so that's that's the origin of that. So we are very close to the end of time and I do want to end on time. Uh, I'd like to and by just asking you in the remaining like two minutes, so you 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 have this career in physics, you've been engaging with questions about the multiverse for a very long time. You've written this incredibly well-researched and excellent book, which I recommend that everybody purchase. Thank you. If you haven't already done so. Um, 
So what's your verdict? Like, where do you, like, what, what is, what are your final parting thoughts to all of us? <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, so my verdict is. Hopefully everyone can see that was both thumbs up and thumbs down. Right. Good. Okay. Yes. Uh, right. So um, I, I try to be balanced, but um, in doing my research, I would say that the version of the multiverse I most believe in, or I think it's most likely, aside from the one of the universe existing beyond the observable universe, which I think is very likely, but I think eternal inflation, the people uh, developing eternal inflation have a very good point that uh, if inflation happens one, one place, it should, ha should be ubiquitous. And it's hard to develop, uh, and I'm told this, um, a successful inf model of inflation that just has one universe. So, um, so, but many, I don't really buy into uh, many worlds explanation of why we get certain particular outcomes. So I don't know if that they've successfully tackled that question yet. Right. Well, we're just at time. So I think this is probably a good place to conclude. Um, thank you so much, Professor Halpern. This has been a very interesting and enlightening conversation. I'm really glad that we were able to be here. And I want to also thank everybody who's joined us for the past hour. Um, thanks for, you know, using your valuable time in this branch of the multiverse to spend with us. Uh, and let me hand things back to Greg. Well, um, yeah, let me, let me just, uh, thank both of you for such a wonderful talk, really intriguing, interesting conversation. Um, uh, and I, I must say, whether or not there are other branches, I am grateful that we are in this universe where we got to have uh, such a such an interesting conversation with two two great stars here. So so thank you uh, both. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us, and uh, hope to see you at a future uh, Harvard Science Book Talk. Good evening. Bye bye. Bye bye.